Hi everybody, it's Richard again here from Electric Classic Cars. We've had a busy old week in the workshop again. We've finished the lovely Gordon Keeble, got a load of test miles on it now and loads more to come as well. And the last video that went up, we've had some fantastic response to that, which I'll come to in a minute. But there was a couple of questions which I asked everybody to see, you know, what's everybody's knowledge out there? And one was a really tough one, which was, which other cars share the rear light cluster with the Gordon Keeble? And the answer is a Ferrari 250 GTE. And another car, which I didn't even realize, which is a, an old Fiat as well. So yeah, a really tough question. Lots of people thought it was a Rover P6, for instance, which was yeah, a good shout because you know, when I looked at that car, you're right, it really does look a very similar rear light cluster, but it's not the same. So the answer was Ferrari 250 GTE and the Fiat, which I forget now, somebody's bound to remember and uh, correct me in the comments below. Uh, the other question I asked was, what was the first car I ever converted? And for those that have been following me for a while will know, it's a 1965 Beetle, beautiful red 1965 Beetle, now lives up uh, just north of Edinburgh, and it's uh, called Burt, for those that don't know. So the other question I asked as well, which was really helpful, thanks everybody for the response, was what sort of content do you guys want to actually see in these videos? And, you know, I was expecting to hear, uh, let's do a lot of, you know, mucking around, wheel spins and stuff like that. But to my pleasant surprise, and thank you everybody, you want lots of technical content, which is right up my street. So all, your, all you tech heads out there, we're going to do a load of series of videos now on real technical information. Um, not too technical, because obviously that will lose some of the audience but more technical content that we can get uh, than we get into our TV show, Vintage Voltage, for instance. So that gives me free reins now to get really into deep tech territory. And the first video we're gonna start off this week is essentially the heart of an electric motor, uh, electric car, if you like, which is motors. So that's the first of this long series. So and there's gonna be loads more content to come, so don't forget to subscribe because the content that we're gonna put out this year is gonna be on another level, not just technical content, but lots of more workshop walkarounds, test drives, we're gonna do events as well, and because it's the way I am, a load of mucking around as well, whether or not it's off-roading or going to drag races and stuff like that, there'll be plenty of that and some test drives as well. So subscribe down below and keep watching and let's get into the tech. Right. Let's crack on with our first tech talk, which is going to be about motors. But we can't talk about motors until we talk about where we've come from, which is the good old fashioned internal combustion engine. So this here is an engine out of a Land Rover Defender behind me. And the main problem I have with engines historically is one of efficiency, let's say. So if you put energy into an engine, it's only going to really turn 30% or 35% of that energy into motion. The rest of it is lost to heat and vibrations and other energy losses. So you've got to remember an engine is not really a very efficient thing. And we're going to be talking about, you know, typical applications or averages here. Yes, there are certain engines, direct injection engines that might be 40% or higher efficiencies, but equally there's others that are way inefficient as well, which are lower. So we're just gonna talk about average numbers here. So the average energy efficiency, if you like, of an engine is around about 35%. The other problem is, just look at it. I mean, you've just got, such complications here. We've got pipes, we've got fuel rails, we've got a turbo on this one. I mean, it's a complicated beast is an engine. So many moving parts. You've got vibrations, heat cycles, maintenance. You've got oil changes, belt changes, filters. You, you, it's high maintenance just to keep these things alive. So as well as the inefficiency, you've got the complexity of these things and the high maintenance of the actual engine itself just to keep it alive. I mean, you've got exhausts here, radiators here, and that's a good example of the inefficiencies of an engine because essentially it's, it's producing so much heat that you need massive radiators and cooling fans just to stop it from grenading, essentially. So that's history, let's say. That's where we've come from. 
This gives you a good idea as to you know, what's been around for the last 100 plus years. And it weighs a lot as well, don't forget. This engine alone weighs around about 210 kilos. Once you add up all the other bits and pieces, like the exhaust, the radiators and stuff like that, you're probably going to be up near like 230, 240 kilos. These things are heavy, big, inefficient dinosaurs. Which is a good time to move on to where we're at now, which is induction motors. So we're going to start with the electric motors with one of the most common electric motors out there, which is a brushless AC induction motor. And what I've got here is a HPEBS AC20 motor, which can give you uh, a good idea for what these are all about. Fairly light, 27 kilos, but don't be fooled. This little baby puts out about 47 horsepower and around about 92 newton meters of torque as well. So 27 kilos of compact power, if you like. Sort of cars we use this in would be something like a Mini or a Fiat 500. And, you know, it's a nice package for a small vehicle like that. It's an induction motor. And what's an induction motor? Well, essentially, as the name suggests, you're inducing the magnetic field in the motor to create the rotation. So it's quite an efficient motor as well, 90% peak efficiency. And I'm using peak numbers here because obviously as the RPM changes with uh, motors and engines, efficiency changes. But just to keep things simple, I'm going to use peak efficiency. So 35% on average for a, a typical engine. 90% efficiency for an AC induction motor. That means that 90% of the energy that I throw at this motor is going to be turned into motion, which is fantastic. So there we go. That's an induction motor. Um, very common uh, motor that's out there. This one's air cooled as well, just to keep it cool, because obviously with 90% efficient means you've got 10% inefficiency, and that will be producing some heat. So you still need to thermally manage these things. Nowhere near as much as an engine. Obviously, that's got, a, you know, radiators and uh, uh, water pumps and coolant pumps, and that coolant is running really hot as well. Whereas this little thing, all you need is a little fan at the uh, front here just to keep it cool. So there we go. That's an induction motor. Very common motors used a lot in most of the electric vehicles that are out there at the moment. But obviously, with the amount of investment in R&D going into motors at the moment, electric vehicles, people have uh, started using more efficient motors, which is this bad boy over here. Now here, we're right up to date with the very latest motor technology that's going into electric vehicles at the moment, which is a synchronous reluctance permanent magnet motor. Now, what is a synchronous reluctance permanent magnet motor? Well, I'm not gonna go into the details of how these things work, because believe me, we will lose 99% of the audience. But let's just summarize it in this way. So a permanent magnet motor does not need to induce a magnetic field through electromagnetism. It's using permanent magnet motors to do that. And one of the benefits of doing that, as well as the you know, simplicity of not having lots and lots of windings uh, around, the, uh, uh, around the motor, is the fact that it's more efficient. So this motor is around about 95% efficient. The induction motor was 90% and the engine was, what, 35%. So with 95% peak efficiency, that means that of the energy that we're throwing at this motor, 95% of that energy is turned into motion. Only 5% is lost in inefficiencies. And that's one of the reasons why this is actually only cooled by this, mag uh, the, by this aluminium fins around this, uh, the outside. It doesn't even need air cooling or water cooling. It's a very, very efficient package. Not only that, but Look at the size of it compared to that motor there. This motor gives us 120 horsepower. That motor or engine over there, that's 120 horsepower as well. So 100, 120 horsepower, that wheezy asthmatic old engine gives us compared to this 120 horsepower, real high efficiency uh, motor. Not only that, but this is probably around about 50 kilos of weight. That's nearly 250 kilos of weight. So for the same amount of power, it's a much smaller package and a fraction of the weight. And obviously, there's not any exhaust pipe on this to, uh, to poison us either. Um, so what would we put this in? Well, a typical application for this would be a small to medium-sized car, uh, something like a VW Beetle, 
an Alfa Romeo Spider behind you, that's got one in. We've even put it, put it in slightly bigger, mo uh, bigger um, cars like a VW Camper, for instance. That's a good fit for it as well. But you don't want to go with something that's too heavy, not um, pulling a trailer or a big, massive 4x4. Um, you know, don't overstress certainly this type of motor, um, the specific motor, because essentially it's got limited cooling on it. It will overheat uh, 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 if you overstress it. But that's a permanent mag motor. This is a Hyper 9 motor from HPEVS. Fantastic solution for medium-sized cars. So that's 235 newton meters of torque, and that's around about 300 newton meters of torque. So yeah, great application for medium-sized cars. Now, if we step over here, I've got a really good um, size comparison between where modern technology is now compared to the old-fashioned technology of engines. So have a look at this. Right, so what I've got here is a good example of why I got into electric motors in the first place, because I'm a power hungry monkey and I wanted lots of power, but in an efficient way. And this beautifully shows that. So what we have here is a Tesla small drive unit. So in a Tesla Model S, for instance, in a dual motor Tesla Model S, you'll have one motor up front and one motor in the rear. And this essentially is the small rear motor, very similar to the small front motor, but the small front is actually tilted up at around about 45 degrees. So this is the motor section here. You've got the gear reduction unit here, which is a 9.73 to one gear reduction unit out to the drive shafts that go out there. And on the side here, we've got the inverter or controller as some people call it. So essentially this is one complete drive unit. So it's the equivalent of an engine, a gearbox, and an ECU and everything, all in one. Look how small it is. I mean, it's, it's 84 kilos, it's nice and small and compact, and that is about 330 newton meters of torque that that knocks out, which is plenty enough. So this is the sort of motor we put in something that was a car they wanted to be a little bit sporty, but not too crazy. So this is actually destined to go in a Porsche 914, which is just over there. And also it's uh, going in a Porsche 944 down the bottom end of the workshop as well. So small Tesla drive unit, great little motor. A Tesla Model 3 motor actually looks fairly similar size wise, but don't forget Tesla Model 3 now have moved to those induction motors, which means it's a bit more efficient than the, uh, sorry, Tesla Model 3 have moved to the permanent magnet motors, which are more efficient than the induction motors on the old Tesla Model S motors. So that is a very compact little power unit. 330 newton meters of torque compared to this beast here, which is also around about 300 newton meters of torque as well. So very similar in torque, but just look at the size of it and the complexity of it. And obviously we've got the gearbox at the back here and all the things to keep it alive, the radiator, the exhaust, etc., etc. And don't forget, this weighs 84 kilos. This with all the other gubbins, the gearbox, the fluids, the exhaust, etc. You're up to around about 350 kilos of weight. 350 kilos of weight compared to 84 kilos of weight. And this is 90% efficient. That is 35% efficient of turning energy into motion. Now this is a small Tesla drive unit. There are bigger ones available. And to give you an example of that, let's go and have a look at a silly car over there. Right, so we've been talking about the Tesla small drive unit over there. Now this is the Tesla large drive unit. And this comes in two flavors, standard or performance. So you've got a choice of like, do you want lots of power or stupid amounts of power? And stupid amounts of power is what I've gone for in my Beetle. So we've got here a performance Tesla drive unit or large Tesla drive unit out of the back of a Tesla Model S. And it's given me 675 Newton meters of torque. And I think it's around about 480 odd horsepower. And it's enough to propel this car from 0 to 60 in 2.6 seconds. Uh, fastest quarter mile I've done in it so far is about 10.5 seconds, which in a 1973 Beetle is fast enough. So that is a Tesla large drive unit. What we've got in here, if you like, is the motor. 
your gear set again so your 9.73 to 1 gear reduction unit in the middle and over here is the actual inverter or controller as some people call it and what is that well that essentially is taking the dc power from the battery and converting it to ac power and also controlling what um, you know speed the motor is doing from things like your throttle response so essentially that is the inverter gear set and motor and look how small the motor is it only goes from about there to there and that's given you about 450 or 500 uh, brake horsepower so 500 brake horsepower 675 newton meters of torque just from that little bit that goes from there to there and that's what i love about motors and why i changed from being a petrol head for god knows how many years to being an electro head because that means I can get huge amount of torques for literally zero maintenance and you know it's a very very efficient use of energy so that's essentially what I've got in there now this is a silly car now what other silly cars uh, are out there that I could put a stupid amount of power in I'd like to hear your comments below to see if there's any more stupid people out there or more silly people out there than me what other small car can we put a massive motor in that you guys would like to see us build comments below please so what other cars would you put a big performance motor in well perfect example is standing right next to the beetle this beautiful bmw csl recreation that we've uh, created it's got a performance drive unit in the rear and a decent amount of batteries in it as well and just look at it it's a stunning looking car so with all the weight gains that you get from a motor yeah, you know, we were talking on that small Tesla drive unit of what about 84 kilos of weight with a similar amount of power to the motor that was sitting next to it, which had 350 kilos of weight. Loads of people are probably thinking, yeah, but what about the batteries? They weigh a ton. Well, we're going to talk about batteries on the next video. So if you subscribe below and join us on the next video, we'll talk about batteries and how that weight gain on motors is pretty much balanced out by batteries but more on that in the next video i really hope you enjoyed this video please comment below if there's any like differences or things you'd like this to improve on we're always there listening out so hopefully we'll see you on the next video